on World News Tonight. Taliban takeover. The Taliban consolidates its power in Afghanistan as foreign diplomats continue to leave the country. Political uncertainty. Malaysian king to appoint new prime minister as unpopular prime minister resigns. Nationwide surges. COVID-19 continues to spread in the United States as Louisiana faces a fourth wave. A perfect match. Senior feline friends get senior owners to spend the rest of their lives with. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. Good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with a look into the aftermath of the fall of Afghanistan. U.S. forces at the airport were forced to fire into the tarmac to restore calm as thousands crowded the tarmac in the hopes of securing a place for a flight out of the country. The Taliban are back in control of Afghanistan two decades after they were ousted by U.S.-led forces. Their fighters were filmed inside the presidential palace in Kabul on Sunday after sweeping across the country meeting little resistance. But while many Afghans fear what is to come, a spokesperson for the militants claimed this is a popular uprising. It, uh, I think uh, an Afghan inclusive government this is uh, the demand, the will, and the want of the people of Afghanistan. They want this government, so it is a popular uprising. Afghanistan's now former president, Ashraf Ghani, has published a statement on social media after fleeing the country. In it, he said he had made the difficult decision to leave the capital in order to avoid bloodshed. Over in New York, the United Nations Security Council called for talks to create a new government in Afghanistan to bring an end to fighting and abuse. This was in response to the long history of human rights violations and crimes against humanity committed by the Taliban, especially towards women. The Taliban's swift and total takeover of Afghanistan, culminating in the capture of the capital, Kabul, was accompanied on Monday by grim reports of violence as the Islamist militants moved to reimpose power. I'm speaking on behalf of millions of people in Afghanistan. The nation's UN ambassador warned of mounting human rights abuses. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres called for an immediate end to hostilities and human rights abuses. We are receiving chilling reports of severe restrictions on human rights throughout the country. And I am particularly concerned by accounts of mounting human rights violations against the women and girls of Afghanistan who fear a return to the darkest days. The UN Security Council later issued a statement calling on the Taliban to establish through negotiations a new government that is united and includes, quote, the full, equal and meaningful participation of women. Uh, One female member of Afghanistan's parliament who was laying low at home spoke over Zoom from Kabul on Monday and said she feared for her life. As the Taliban gained ground, thousands of civilians desperate to flee crowded Kabul's airport giving way to horrifying scenes. The return to Taliban rule came as U.S. and other foreign forces were leaving the country 20 years after the Islamist militants were ousted by a U.S.-led invasion. Guterres appealed to the 15-member Security Council to, quote, use all tools at its disposal to suppress a global terrorist threat from Afghanistan to ensure that other countries were not threatened or attacked. Over at the White House, President Joe Biden defended the withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan, blaming the Taliban's takeover on not only former President Donald Trump, but also Afghan political leaders who fled the country and the unwillingness of the Afghan army to fight the militant group. I stand squarely behind my decision. Facing fierce blowback for the chaos that ensued after the withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan, President Joe Biden Monday defended his administration's handling of the evacuation, saying that while the Taliban's rise was quicker than expected, Afghanistan's political leaders fled the country and left behind an Afghan army unwilling to fight the militant Islamists. This did unfold more quickly than we had anticipated. So what's happened? Afghanistan political leaders gave up and fled the country. 
The Afghan military collapsed, sometime without trying to fight. If anything, the developments of the past week reinforced that ending U.S. military involvement in Afghanistan now was the right decision. He has also blamed his predecessor, former President Donald Trump, for empowering the Taliban and leaving them, quote, in the strongest position militarily since 2001. The decision to withdraw sparked criticism from allies and adversaries after the Afghan government collapsed within days and the U.S. scrambled to evacuate American civilians and embassy employees from Kabul. The Taliban's advance led to harrowing scenes of thousands of civilians desperate to flee the country, prompting the U.S. on Monday to temporarily suspend evacuations. A social media video showed Afghans desperately clinging to the outside of a U.S. military aircraft on the tarmac at the airport in Kabul, and later, this video that showed objects falling from a plane. The political risks facing Biden for this decision, however, remain to be seen. Many Americans have expressed support for Trump and Biden's decision to leave Afghanistan, America's longest war. Biden also said his decision is a result of the commitment he made to American troops that he wasn't going to ask them to continue to risk their lives for a war that should have ended long ago. Biden coupled his defense with a warning to Taliban leaders, let the U.S. withdrawal proceed unimpeded. Western nation rushed to evacuate their citizens and local staff from Kabul after the Taliban's lighting fast takeover of Afghanistan. However, China and Russian Federation shocked the international community as both nations issued statements that they did not plan to evacuate the embassies. The Afghan flag goes down in Kabul. As the Taliban declared the war over, a new battle, the fight for influence, got underway. China became the first major nation to flag support for the Taliban, saying it was ready for friendly relations. The militants have already reassured China that they wouldn't host regal militants from Xinjiang province that borders Afghanistan. Russia, meanwhile, says its diplomats are in contact with the Taliban to work out a permanent mechanism of ensuring safety for its embassy. The diplomatic charm offensives stand in sharp contrast to some Western powers scrambling to get their nationals out of Afghanistan. The United States sent 6,000 troops to the airport in Kabul to ensure the safe evacuation of its citizens. Amateur images show U.S. military aircraft trying to control crowds of Afghans on the runway. While Joe Biden watched on from Camp David, the U.S. government issued a joint statement along with more than 60 countries calling for calm and the safe departure of foreign nationals and Afghans who want to leave. The Afghan people deserve to live in safety, security and dignity. We in the international community stand ready to assist them. France's ambassador has also left the country. The defence minister announced earlier that French citizens, as well as, quote, Afghans who had rendered service to the French armed forces, would be airlifted to safety. Tens of thousands of Afghans have left their homes to flee the violence. Some European countries are bracing for a possible refugee crisis. It's going to a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back. Moving on to the Caribbean now. Doctors in Haiti battled in makeshift tents to save the lives of hundreds of injured people, including young children and the elderly, outside hospitals overwhelmed by an earthquake that killed at least 1,420 people. Doctors in Haiti battled to save the lives of hundreds of people, both young and old, in makeshift hospital tents on Monday. Three days after a major earthquake, the death toll has topped over 1,400, and health officials say that number is likely to rise. The earthquake brought down tens of thousands of buildings, including churches, hotels, schools, and over 37,000 homes. Rescue teams scramble to dig out survivors ahead of Tropical Storm Grace, hovering over the island's southern coast. Local residents confirmed heavy rain has already caused flooding near the worst hit areas, exacerbating the humanitarian crisis. The U.S. National Hurricane Center forecast Grace would douse the quake zone with up to 15 inches of rain through Tuesday. Meanwhile, the United Nations has called for a humanitarian corridor to pass aid through gang-held territories. 
Colombia and the U.S. dispatched search and rescue teams along with vital supplies, while Mexico promised to support Haiti in its recovery. In another instance of the heat wave sweeping through Europe, the chain of wildfires occurring around the continent has now entered the French mainland. For more on this, we have Abu Dharana World News Special Correspondent Chetana Dar Maratna, who joins us now from Normandy in France. Chetana. Yes, Chenali. Thousands of people have been evacuated in southeastern France to escape a rapidly advancing wildfire. The evacuations in the coastal war department took place in the hinterland particular around villages of Grimaud and Lamal near Saint-Tropez. The fire broke out on Monday at the Sikh motorway service area, about 100 kilometers northeast of Tulum. By early morning, it had traveled 22 kilometers and burned 5,000 hectares of forest. About 100 houses were damaged. Some 750 firefighters were battling in the blaze overnight. Four fire flighting planes and a helicopter were deployed in the morning to assist them. Many Mediterranean countries have been hit by ragging fires this summer, which were fueled by scorching temperatures, including Greece, Italy, Algeria, Spain, Turkey, and Morocco. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was other than a world news special correspondent Chetan Adarmaratna reporting from Normandy in France. Now over in North America, a large gas explosion in a residential building killed at least one person and left dozens injured in Mexi Mexico's capital, Mexico City. A large gas explosion in a residential building in Mexico City on Monday has injured dozens and killed at least one person. The source of the gas leak was not immediately clear. But the Mexico City Prosecutor's Office is investigating, along with experts. Mara Gutierrez was one of the residents who escaped to safety. There was a very strong explosion. All the glass started to break. At first, I thought it was an earthquake. I told my daughter, let's go, we need to get out. So we tried to get out among all the pieces of glass. Rescuers and police officers evacuated residents due to the structural damage caused by the blast and as a precaution to nearby buildings. Local officials have also pledged to support those whose homes were damaged. Now in Asia, Malaysian Prime Minister Moedin Yassin resigned, ending a torrid 17 month in office as he battled political inf infighting and questioning over his legitimacy while his government faced a raging health crisis and an economic downturn. For more on this, let's cross over to other than a world news special correspondent Avantika Gunasekaran joining us from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Avantika. Yes, Shanali. Malaysia's Muhyiddin Yassin stepped down as Prime Minister after months of political turmoil resulted in the loss of his majority and his resignation is likely to open another chapter of instability in the absence of any obvious successor. Muhyiddin's resignation ends a tumultuous 17 months in office, the shortest stint of a Malaysian leader, but will also likely hamper efforts to reboot an economy stricken by the global health crisis and curb a resurgence of infections. Since he took office with a slim majority in March 2020, he has been beset by coalition infighting, saying the recent crisis was brought on by his refusal of demands such as dropping graft charges against some individuals. The nation's king appointed Muhyiddin as the caretaker prime minister until a new premier can be found, but did not give a timeline. King Al Sultan Abdullah ruled out elections because of the health crisis and said he would invoke his constitutional power to appoint a prime minister he believes is likely to command a majority. Back to you, Shanali. Thank you. That was Adh Dharana World News Special Correspondent Avantika Gunasekharan joining us from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Now looking at the COVID-19 pandemic, New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern put the nation under strict lockdown after one new community case of the coronavirus was reported in its largest city of Auckland, the country's first in six months. All of New, New, New Zealand will be in lockdown for three days while Auckland and Coromandel, a coastal town that the infected person had also spent time in will be in lockdown for seven days. Imposing its toughest level four lockdown rules, schools, offices and all businesses will be shut down and only essential services will be operational.
Aden said authorities were assuming the new case was a Delta variant infection, although this has not been confirmed. The country has reported about 2,500 confirmed cases of the coronavirus and 26 related deaths. Louisiana in the United States is drowning in its fourth wave. With overflowing ICUs, doctors have pivoted from their normal roles to help fill in for nurses. Louisiana is drowning in its fourth COVID wave. Overflowing ICUs at Ochsner Hospital in New Orleans have forced more than 100 doctors to pivot from their normal jobs, including cancer surgeon Brian Moore. A number of us have uh, worked as nurses' aides uh, on day shift and night shift in the ICU to, to help them just do basic stuff. Just in the last month, average daily cases in Louisiana have grown nearly eightfold. Since the start of the weekend, more than 13,200 COVID cases have been reported with nearly 3,000 people currently hospitalized. That is the highest since the pandemic started. The vast majority are tied to COVID that is spreading in communities rather than settings like nursing homes. Starting today, everyone in New Orleans, 12 and older, has to show proof of at least one dose of a COVID vaccination or a negative PCR test result within the last 72 hours. Now, this applies to indoor restaurants, bars, and gyms. And beginning tomorrow in New York City, you can't even get by with a negative test. There, it's no vax, no service. USA! USA! Not everyone is happy. Protesters gathered outside the mayor's home at Gracie Mansion Sunday afternoon. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin sued the U.S. government over NASA's decision to avoid a $2.9 billion lunar lander contract to Elon Musk's SpaceX. Blue Origin said its lawsuit filed in the U.S. Court of Federal Claims. Australian authorities warned Sydney residents to brace for a surge in COVID-19 cases in the coming weeks, urging people to get vaccinated to avoid more hospitalization and deaths as daily infections hovered near record levels. Ivory Coast began vaccinating health workers in the commercial capital Abu Jan against Ebola after a case of the deadly virus was confirmed over the weekend. U.S. officials issued an official shortage declaration of the massive western reservoir of Lake Med for the first time triggering water cuts to the drought-stricken southwest. Spanish authorities said the country's biggest wildfire of the year sweeping through the province of Avila was evolving favorably after firefighters battled the blaze through the day. Over in Asia, China's factory output and retail sales growth slowed sharply and missed expectations in July as new COVID-19 outbreaks and floods disrupted business operations, adding to signs of economic recovery is losing momentum. The economic leap China's seen in recent months has lost momentum, with factories facing major disruptions and a retail dip in July. The world's second largest economy has largely bounced back to its growth levels before the pandemic. Now, though, it's facing fresh outbreaks of the coronavirus and widespread flooding in several regions. The service sector has been hit especially hard, including the travel and hospitality industries. Chinese spokesperson Fu Linghui said Monday recovery is expected to stay uneven. Data released Monday showed that consumers cut back on spending across the board as retail sales fell short of analyst estimates. Meanwhile, businesses have struggled with supply bottlenecks and higher costs of raw materials. July also saw exports slow, a key driver of China's recovery. Further travel disruptions and lockdowns due to the health crisis are expected, prompting a growing number of analysts to slash their growth estimates for China in the third quarter. And finally tonight, senior cats that lose their human companions are often euthanized or spend the rest of their lives alone. A program in the United States is finding homes for them with senior citizens to ensure both live happy and perfect lives. A recent cat adoption fair in Northern Virginia, the kittens got all the love while the senior cats were largely ignored. Sadly, cats who lose their human companions are often euthanized or spend the rest of their lives alone. 
Riley is 12. Kathy Awad is the founder of Fancy Cats, which has placed more than 25,000 cats, many through its program, Senior Cats for Senior Laps. Most seniors just want companionship, but Kitten is not going to do that. It's a growing trend. There are now at least 56 shelters in 35 states that have a Pets for Seniors program for cats and senior dogs who also face difficulty getting adopted. Bonnie Paul has five senior cats, including 12-year-old Gracie. The day we were there, she decided she was simply not going to perform for that camera. But normally, Paul says, they're all very affectionate. And there are plenty of senior cats, like Riley, just waiting for their chance to fall in love. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Dani Duvitanamos and we'll be back tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.